Welcome to the History Nerd United Podcast. I'm your head nerd, Brendan. Thank you so much for being here. Today, Adam Brooks and his book, Fragile Cargo, The World War II Race to Save the Treasures of China's Forbidden City. I know what you're thinking, because I thought it too. Uh, that's just moving around art. How can that possibly be interesting? It is. I don't, I don't know how to explain it to you. Thank God Adam is here, because he's the one that figured out how to make this riveting, and it is. There's great characters in this. This is a part of World War II that is very much ignored, especially if you're talking about American writers. I've never seen anything about this. Yes, it is packing up and moving art, but it feels like I'm reading Indiana Jones. I, I don't know how Adam did it, but he did. You can hear me talk to him all about it right now because I'm going to shut up. Let's do it. And here we are with author Adam Brooks, Fragile Cargo, the World War II race to save the treasures of China's forbidden city. Adam, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. The book is super interesting. I do want to say you've been a journalist, but you've also written some really, really well-received fiction. What made you decide you were going to do a nonfiction book now? You know, it was really just encountering the story and realizing that nobody else had really given it a shot in English before. There's quite a lot of uh, uh, knowledge out there in Chinese. There's a lot of material out there in Chinese regarding the story of the imperial art collections during the Second World War and everything that happened to them, but not much in English. And when I first heard about the story, I, I literally sat down and Googled what's out there, who's written about it already, and was astonished to discover that there was no full telling in English. And, you know, I read Chinese, I spent a lot of time in China. I have some kind of grounding in 20th century Chinese history. And so I thought I would give it a shot. It was really just a story falling into my lap in a way that it really only does once or twice in a career. So I thought I would give it a go. Now, how good is your Chinese? If I dropped you into the middle of China, would people be amazed at what came out of your mouth? I, <laughs> I don't know, they might be amazed at how awful it sounds. When I was living in China, uh, it was okay. It was all right. I wouldn't say I'm fluent. Um, I can operate in Chinese. I was able to work as a journalist reasonably effectively in Chinese. I can read kind of okay. I read slowly, but reasonably effectively. I had to fight my way through up huge amounts of material to research the book. And I got a researcher to help me weed out the stuff that I didn't need to read. Uh, and that saved me months and months of work. Some of the material was very, very difficult. It was written in very old fashioned kind of bureaucratic literary Chinese. I was very slow at reading. So, so I got some professional help with that as well. But when, when it was re vernacular Chinese, I could read it, read it reasonably well. So, I mean, I'd give myself like, I don't know, six and a half out of 10, something like that. Uh, that's pretty good. It's certainly a lot better than me. Uh, I'm still probably six out of 10 on English, but <laughs> neither here nor there. <laughs> what I will say to it, especially as I'm reading this, because it's a really interesting story. And like you said, it just hasn't been tackled in English, which I think there's already World War II, the Pacific, generally speaking, is ignored. But then within the Pacific time period, what happens to China is very often overlooked. Is that something that it just doesn't sell? Is it something because we have, let's say, a complicated history with China right now? Why are these stories not readily available in English? It's a really good question. It's one I've kind of thought about a lot. I think there are lots of different reasons. One of them is that China's World War II experience the experiences of soldiers and civilians who went through that were suppressed after the war. When Mao came to power, you had to be very careful what you said about anything at all. Mao wanted to get past World War II with the Japanese. Mao and the Chinese Communist Party wanted to rebuild the relationship with China. And they wanted to suppress any discussion of World War II that didn't serve the party's interests. Remember that China's resistance to Japan was largely carried out not by the Communist Party of China, but by Jiang Kai-shek's nationalist government of China. Uh, so the nationalist experience of the war, in other words, most of the fighting that was done against the Japanese, was suppressed. You couldn't talk about it. You couldn't write memoirs about it. If you said that you were a, a nationalist officer uh, in Mao's China, you'd be sent off to a labor camp, probably. So it was suppressed in China for a long time. That memory was kind of never taken out and looked at. And even in Taiwan, where the nationalists fled to in 1949, you had to be very careful what you said and did in the early days of the Republic of China on Taiwan too. 
So a lot of Chinese memory never got written down, never went into memoir, never got discussed. And then in the United States, you know, Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists were the people who lost China to communism and their government and their resistance to Japan got lost in the mix. Nobody ended up paying them any attention for a long time. There was a whole host of reasons why memory of China's World War II experience got lost. And it only really started getting recovered again in the 1990s. Now, I absolutely love the prelude to this book where you basically drop the reader into the Forbidden City to kind of give people an idea of where these treasures were and all of that stuff. Because, I mean, I know a lot of people, if they're not necessarily into history, they're going to be like, they moved some treasures around. How interesting could this be? Was the prelude kind of your way of just adding real heft to what you were going to talk about? Because let's even jump back. What was the Forbidden City? What was it like? And for specifically for the prelude, what were you kind of trying to do for the reader? So, you know, outside East Asia, there isn't a lot of knowledge of Chinese history uh, at all. We don't study it in school. You know, we in the United States are not very China competent. So it was very important for me to try and get the reader into the idea of what imperial China was and why we should care about its treasures and its art. We in the West know very little about Chinese art or Chinese art history. So I decided to try and paint a little picture of imperial China, particularly the emperor's life in imperial China. In the center of Beijing, what today we call Beijing, is the imperial precincts, those great big imperial buildings with the red walls and the yellow tiled roofs that you probably can visualize. And then in the middle of those imperial precincts, is the Forbidden City. And the Forbidden City was the place where the emperors of the Ming Empire and the Qing Empire from the 15th century through to the early 20th century, that's where the emperors lived. And in the Forbidden City, only the emperor and his household could live and move freely. And inside the Forbidden City was this colossal collection of art. It was scattered through all the palaces uh, and the halls, and a lot of it was in storage. And it was this kind of secret, unseen hoard of art that only the emperor could see. And it was sort of deeply entwined with the mystique of imperial China. A point of reference for this is sometimes people liken it a bit to something like the crown jewels of England, right? They're not as any jewels, they're the crown jewels of England, that they belong to the queen, they're imperial special royal jewels. Well, this art was sort of like that. It was the imperial art. And it was everything. It was paintings, it was it was tapestries, it was jewels, it was jade, it was bronzes, it was a vast amalgam of stuff. Imperial China comes to a close with the fall of the Qing Empire in 1911. That's the end of a thousand years of monarchy in China. And the imperial art at this point is just left inside these echoing empty palaces. The emperor is still there with a few old princes and a few eunuchs hanging around until 1924, when the emperor's finally kicked out of the Forbidden City. And now these palaces are completely empty, uh, sealed up, locked up. And a load of art historians and curators are sent into the Forbidden City, into these empty palaces, to start cataloging the art, to figure out exactly what is in the palaces. And that's sort of where my narrative begins, is with these extraordinary art historians and curators, these Chinese professors and graduate students for the most part, who went into these palaces and catalogued the imperial collections and counted 1.17 million pieces of art and texts inside the palaces. And that's kind of where Fragile Cargo begins, with the stories of these curators making their way through these freezing cold, empty, echoing palaces in the winter of 1924 and 1925. That was my first holy cow moment, was that 1.7 million, right? Because you're thinking of just, oh, it was it would be like a big museum if we had to go chronicle a big museum right now. And 1.7 million, and then they're just, they're locked away. Like, people have no idea what's in there. So, I mean, the people who first walked in, I mean, did they have any idea what they were getting into? Did they think they knew the scale 
Uh, they didn't really know. So, so there was some conception among scholars, you know, among art historians, there was kind of some conception of what might be in there. And some of the greatest works of art that were in there in the imperial collections had been seen through Chinese history and people had written about it and there were commentaries about it. And some of this art, you know, is, is, was 2000 years old. Uh, we're talking about stuff dating back two and a half millennia. Uh, so throughout Chinese history, some of this stuff had been known about, but the curators themselves didn't really know what they were going to find. So for them, it was absolutely revelatory. Day after day, they were literally opening drawers and pulling out these incredible works of art from a thousand years ago and finding astonishing bronzes that had been written about by historians and scholars 17, 1800 years ago. Uh, and they were finally seeing these things, laying eyes on them for the first time. So yeah, it was an absolute revelation. What they were seeing was a kind of a map to China's artistic and intellectual history. And they were suddenly kind of realizing that they had this incredible kind of patrimony on their hands, and they had to decide what to do with it. And what they decided to do with it, of course, was to make a museum out of it, just the way that their young republic, you know, desired to have a great museum, just the way that Paris has the Louvre or the British Museum in London or the Met in New York. You know, they wanted to have their museum as a great statement of national identity. So in 1925, they opened this kind of ramshackle museum without any proper lighting and terrible display cases and and they opened this up in the Forbidden City in 1925. And the Chinese public goes absolutely wild for it. And the Chinese public descends in their tens of thousands on this new museum. And the crowds are barely manageable and nobody can see anything in the display cases because there are so many crowds. It's just an extraordinary moment in the development of modern China in the early 20th century was this foundation of this huge central cultural institution that was in some way embodying the aspirations of the young Chinese Republic. What I have to say is one of the things that makes this so readable, right? Because there is a version of this book that is very dry, but you make it feel honestly almost like a thriller. But one of the things that really comes through is your love for this subject so much, because I can feel you getting excited when you write about a piece of art or when the art starts moving, it almost feels like you're like, please don't let them break this. Personal question right off the bat, before we get into having to move this stuff, is there a particular favorite that you wrote about in this book from this collection that you wish you could have a lot of time with? I'll even give you top two if you want, or you can just pick one. I think it would probably be the painting that I, that I write about at some length. It's called Early Snow on the River. It's a hand scroll, which means you lay it on a flat surface and unroll it from right to left. Uh, it doesn't hang on a wall. You, you, you have a special kind of ritual for untying it. You lay it in front of you and you unroll it bit by bit. And it's a long, long hand scroll that was painted in the 10th century by a painter called Zhao Gan in a little place called the Southern Tang Kingdom. At the time, China was fragmented into all these different little states and statelets. And one of these little statelets was called the Southern Tang Kingdom, not far from contemporary Shanghai. It's just the most beautiful, evocative study of life on a river in the 10th century and how fishermen made their living on a river in the 10th century. It's a cold, early winter day. There's snow coming down. There are pine trees and reeds and ripples on the water. And there are fishermen just poling their little boats, their skiffs along the river and their fishing nets. And they're huddling in their little reed huts for warmth and they're lighting fires. And it's just an absolutely exquisite, beautiful, very, very closely observed moment in these people's lives. It's a kind of little universe, a little place completely unto itself. It's a very generous, very loving, very expressive look at humanity in one place at one time. And I just find it, yeah, permanently, deeply moving. And I could spend any amount of time with it and do. You can see it online if you just look it up. Google it online, you can find a very, very high quality version of the painting online where you can just sit and study it, scroll along it on your screen hour after hour. And it's just absolutely beautiful. Highly recommended. 
Have you ever been tempted to go full Nicolas Cage in National Treasure and just, you know, it, steal it to put it in your library? You don't have to say it officially on, on camera. It's fine. It's locked deep in the vaults of the National Palace Museum, Taipei, and it's very, very rarely brought out because it's ink on silk. And so light does photochemical damage to it. So it's very, very rare that you, uh, you anybody ever gets to see it even. Well, listen, if somehow an Ocean's Eleven thing happens and that goes missing, I'm sorry, but you're going to be number one on, the, <laughs> on Interpol's list. So uh, something else besides the treasures, there is, I would say, a, a main character, um, and I might butcher it, Ma Heng. Am I saying that one right? Yeah, Ma yeah that's right, Ma Heng. That's right. Yeah, and Ma. he's kind of your central character. There's some other very important ones, but he's kind of your central character. How does he come into the story and how does he kind of push this forward? So he's a fascinating guy. Uh, he was born in the late 19th century, just outside Shanghai. So he grew up at the very end of, of the Qing Empire. He was a very talented kid. He always loved learning and scholarship from a young age. But he became a businessman and he married into a very wealthy family in Shanghai. And for a long time, he was a businessman. He dealt in hardware stores and in match factories and banking in Shanghai. But he always wanted to be a traditional Chinese scholar. He wanted he wanted to study the classics, he wanted to study art and history. And in 1917, he decides to change his life and he goes to Peking, which today we call Beijing. He goes to Peking and he goes to Peking University and he becomes a lecturer there. And in 1924, when these teams go into the empty Forbidden City to start cataloging the art, Ma Hung goes with them. And he's one of the people who start identifying and cataloging all these more than a million pieces of art. And then he goes on, when the, when the Forbidden City becomes a museum, he goes on to occupy a senior position there. And he's a fascinating character because he's very much a part of the transition that China is going through at this point from the traditional to the modern. He's both a traditional Chinese scholar but he's also a modern student of archaeology, particularly. And he's one of the people that lays down the principles of modern archaeology in China. And he goes on to become the director of the museum, of what we call the Palace Museum in the Forbidden City. And he ends up being in charge of the effort to evacuate and preserve this art all the way through the Second World War. This very gentle, very quiet, very retiring rather wealthy, very well-dressed man who loved a cigar and was very considered in his speech. He ends up being a central character in the whole story. And I also find him very interesting because he is in a lot of ways heroic in this story, but he's not like jumping on the back of a truck and, and, and shooting at Japanese or anything like that. It's almost this fortitude and this competency that makes him heroic because he really cares about these treasures and he, geez, moves heaven and earth to make it happen. Is he kind of like the perfect person when you're trying to write this story and you want to find that kind of beating heart of the story? He's kind of a godsend, right? He was absolutely great. You're right. I mean, he had a very distinct character. Others describe him quite a lot in the memoir. So you get a sense of him from the outside. He didn't write his own memoir or, or only a very brief one. So it's hard to hear his voice, except through his poetry, which we have. He used to write a lot of poetry, and we have his poetry. So you can sort of see into the mind of the man through that. So that was wonderful. But yeah, he's like the anti-Indiana Jones. <laughs> he's terribly calm. He's very meticulous. He's very fastidious. And of course, if you work in wartime logistics... You're not looking at people who are traditional macho heroes. You're looking at people who are incredibly good at detail and have enormous endurance and enormous patience and also who are very careful leaders, not military leaders, you know, leading their troops from the front, but people who are able to manage large teams of people and keep them on task for years at a time in terrible conditions. That's who Ma Hung was. And he inspired enormous loyalty in the people who worked for him. I think because he was this rather gentle, retiring soul that everybody desperately felt they wanted to look after and support all the time because he was such, he was, he was very anxious a lot of the time. And you can feel his anxiety about what's going on with the art. How are we going to keep it safe from the bombing? How are we going to keep it dry? How are we going to create it properly so that it doesn't break when we move it around? How are we going to find safe places to store it 
How are we going to keep it from the Japanese invaders? All these questions just prey on him day after day, month after month, year after year. And in the end, he is the guy who oversees for 16 years the movement of a quarter of a million pieces of art all over China without losing any. Quite a lot gets broken, but I don't think any got lost. And that's really pretty remarkable achievement for such a kind of gentle, quiet guy. Well, Adam, let's get to the sexy stuff, right? Packing and transportation. I never thought I'd be talking about this on a podcast. I know, but... I know. It's extraordinary. <laughs> it's extraordinary, isn't it? Who would think packing art could be so riveting? But it turns out that the packing of this stuff, when they decide in 1932, you know, the Japanese are beginning to gobble up China. Japanese aircraft are uh, overhead all the time. Shanghai has been bombed by the Japanese. They're in real trouble. The Japanese are only four hours away from Peking by road now. And they decide in the Forbidden City, Ma Hung and his bosses, the directors of the museum, decide they've got to evacuate this stuff. So they choose about a quarter of a million pieces that they're going to evacuate and move to the far west of China to keep them from the Japanese. And the packing gets underway. And of course, you know, if you pack this incredibly fragile porcelain, if you pack thousand-year-old paintings, you've got to pack it in such a way that if you drop it, it's not going to break. If it gets wet, then the stuff inside is going to be protected. And the logistics of that are incredibly difficult. So all, a lot of the memoir from our curators who wrote memoirs of this time is about, oh God, how on earth are we going to move this stuff in such a way that we don't end up breaking it or losing it or destroying it? Uh, and the packing is an integral part of that. You Using cotton wadding and hemp cord and heavy paper and, and the husks of rice and straw to kind of keep everything immobile and perfectly safe and dry inside these cases turns into this absolute kind of epic story, which was um, a central part of the entire effort. And of course, when you end up as you do later, when they begin to transport this stuff, trucks are falling off mountainsides and rolling over off bridges. But the packing is so central and is so good that a remarkably small amount of stuff got broken. Uh, so yes, the packing is a central part of the story. Well, and you also mentioned the second part, which is that transportation, which is they're in the middle of a war. They're fighting for their lives. It's not like there's just trucks around. You're like, hey, throw it on that truck and go. It becomes a, well, sometimes it's a truck. Sometimes it's a boat. Sometimes the boat might capsize. Sometimes this river might try and kill you by itself, let alone the art. So, and you almost get into that Indiana Jones stuff. And I, I always just kept picturing, you know, these kind of bookish curators standing on a boat going, well, what do I do if this thing goes down? Because a lot of it is going down with me. And that's how they felt. I mean, day after day, month after month, they're in this permanent state of kind of heart-pounding anxiety because they never really know what's around the next corner. You know, we're talking 20,000 wooden cases full of art that has to get moved from eastern China to western China. A lot of it's going to go up river on steamships, on little boats, and sometimes on bamboo rafts, with guys literally working with bamboo poles to move these cases of art up river. Some of it's going to go by train, and a lot of it's going to go by truck. And it goes by on three great big routes, from eastern China to western China, over about two years in the late 1930s, with the Japanese hot on its heels and with Japanese aircraft overhead all the time. The curators at Ma Hung and his guys, his team of guys, are improvising, 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 day by day, week by week. They don't know how they're going to keep this stuff moving. They turn out to be very effective logisticians. And there are two guys, particularly, two curators. There's a guy named Ouyang Daoda, who turns out to be an absolute holy terror. He's an expert in Chinese art, but he's also an absolutely hard-nosed disciplinarian, and he will put up with no funny business at all. And he is absolutely on all the other curators all the time to be incredibly disciplined about how they move the cases, how they instruct the porters to move the cases, and keeping records. They must keep a minute record of where everything is every day. 
And he is just, yeah, this guy's terrifying. So he's central to the whole thing just because everybody lived in daylight terror of his wrath. And there's another guy whose name is Nadja Liang. And he's, this, he's an expert in Chinese jade. And he just turns out to be this incredibly resilient, very hard-headed, practical man. And wartime logistics seem to come quite naturally to him. And he's one of these people who doesn't seem to feel stress or pressure very much. He just deals with it. And he's able to find pleasure and good humor in the most awful moments when everything is going wrong and there's bombing going on all around them and no one's had any food for days and their, sal- their salaries aren't going through and the Japanese are weeks behind them and their cases are being stored in rickety warehouses and get, uh, warehouses and getting covered in rain and sleet and hail and snow. He still manages to keep going and to keep everybody on task with kind of good humor. And his contribution, whenever there was a really awful problem, Ma Hung, the director of the museum, turned to him and said, please, for the love of God, can you go to this place and sort this out? And he did again and again and again. And how, you know, what kind of emotional and psychological resilience and backbone it takes to do that? Like I say, we're talking 16 years these people did this. This wasn't six months. This wasn't, you know, a campaign across Normandy or something. 16 years they did this. And Nigel Liang is there throughout, start to finish. And so is Ma Hung. So their personal stories, I think I learned a lot about kind of psychological resilience and leadership in this and how you exist and you, you endure in, in those wartime conditions. I think Na was my favorite because of everything you just said. I just picture him as that kind of good soldier who just gets a telegram and goes, what? Okay, I I guess we're doing this today. And just that guy that, and you say to the book, he could get stuff done. He he would just, you handed it to him and he was going to figure it out no matter how ridiculous, no matter how few trucks there were, you wanted something done, you could count on him. And then at the end of the day, he's able to like take a deep breath and he wanders off and he, in his memoir, he'll talk to you about how exciting he gets about wandering off into some little town where they are and sampling all the local food, you know. And then he writes about what he ate that night. And they have a really strange kind of dofu in this place I'd never tried before. And my God, I could get a whole uh, a sesame chicken for only half, you know, half a dollar. And he and he's then is he goes to a bookstore and he says, and then I found this wonderful book. And and he's always finding pleasure in the moment, which is very striking. And again, as a writer, is an absolute godsend because it gives you all this lovely texture and you see deep into his character, but also deep into what life was actually like on the road in wartime China. And he's also very moving and very powerful when he describes air raids. He gets caught in an air raid at one point in Chengdu and he doesn't spend long on it, but it's very powerful. He describes, you know, the the noises that the wounded make. And he describes walking down wrecked streets in bombed Western China. And you suddenly, you start getting the smell and the feel of the utter destruction that Japan wrought in China. You know, remember, this is a war that killed 20 million Chinese people, right? 20 million people. And Nigel Liang and his memoir takes you into that wartime uh, moment in very powerful ways, yeah. It's not completely divorced from these bigger things that we do know about. There was actually one time during the book where I said out loud, oh no, which is, as you mentioned, there are three different routes, right? This isn't just one way, it's three different ways, but one of the places that they decide to send some things to is Nanking. And if you know World War II history, you know, they don't know it, but like that's going to be the scene of just one of the worst massacres in history. And that's one of the stops along the way. So, I mean, as you said, it's not like they put them somewhere and everything's fine. It's a constant movement for years. And some of those places ended up just being dang near wiped off the map. Yeah, and 20,000 cases of art were still in Nanking in late November 1937, or when the Japanese were moving inland. Nanking was was the capital of China at the time. And they only got the art out. They didn't succeed in getting it all out of Nanking. They got 17,000 cases out of Nanking just 10 days before the Japanese took the city. And as you say, you know, we all know what happened in Nanking when the Japanese took it. It, it, was, it was a terrible, terrible slaughter 
And the conditions under which they got that art out are just really jaw-dropping. The city was literally burning as they did it. And there's discussion about, you know, it took hundreds of porters and it took trucks and it took steamships and it took railways and rolling stock to get that stuff out. And the art was prioritized over people. You know, people were trying to get out too at the same time. But steamships and rolling stock were put aside to get these 17,000 cases of imperial art treasures out when they could have been getting people out, but the government decided they were going to get the art out instead. So, you know, there was those real kind of ethical questions around what was done, particularly at that moment as well, with everything that was to come. And it feels like, too, that you took a little time in the book that Nanking wasn't just a stop, that you wanted to talk a little bit about what happened there. Was it something that you felt it was important to the story to add that? Was it something that when something is that historically significant, you wanted to add a little bit more to it? And especially you you talk about that as the Japanese are going through, there are certain places that, you know, international people are allowed to be and the Japanese are kind of supposed to leave them alone. But these places were not secure. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So one of the weird things about China in the early 20th century was it has these little bits of extraterritoriality. It had what were called the concessions, the foreign concessions. Foreign concessions were little bits of China that had been carved out and were administered by foreign powers, some by the Brits, some by the French, some by the Germans, some by the Japanese, a bit by the Russians. And at different times, these little kind of islands of foreign administration existed all over eastern China. So there were always foreigners in China, and the Japanese kind of, as they invaded, they sort of moved around. They 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 didn't take these foreign concessions. They kind of moved around them. They bypassed them. So you have these foreigners' accounts of everything that's going on because there were many foreigners in the concessions at the time. So that adds a lot to our understanding of what China went through. There were quite a lot of foreigners in Nanking at the time when the Japanese took it. We have their diaries, which tell us a lot about what took place there. Because the art went through that city and because of its significance in the wartime story, I felt I couldn't just not talk about it. I felt I had to do something. But the Nanking massacre is very hard to write about. It's very contested. The versions that come out of contemporary China are very different to those that come out of contemporary Japan today. It's not settled history. It's very difficult to get your arms around. So it's a tricky thing to write about. I felt I had to kind of attempt it. You can't just pass over it. It was maybe the hardest thing I did in the whole book, actually, with those few pages, was just trying to figure out how to treat the the story of, of, of Nanjing. I hope it gives some sense of what happened while tying it into the story that I'm trying to tell about the imperial art and Chinese lived experience in the war. Now, if I could put you in a time machine and let you talk to any one of the characters in your book for an hour, you get to ask them anything. Who would you pick out of the book to talk to? That's a really good question. I've never thought of that before. Our chief guy, Ma Hung, the director of the Palace Museum, would have been a great guy to talk to, but he was very reserved and he was very quiet. So would he be, he was terribly cautious in his words. He, he kind of rooted in the Confucian scholarly tradition. You know, everything's very measured, lots of self-control. So would he have been a great guy to talk to? I don't know. The guy I mentioned a moment ago, Na Zhe Liang, he would have been a great conversationalist because he was just such fun. He loved to drink. You know, he was a great boozer. There was another curator, a man named Zhuang Yen, who I focus on quite a bit in the book, who was a very thoughtful, rather wry observer of events, a great student of Chinese history, a beautiful calligrapher and writer. I think maybe he might have been the guy to sit down with and talk to just because he has a very vivid way of describing events in his writing. He's very emotionally invested in the art. He cares deeply about it. He also loved to drink. He was a, he would love to sit down with a bottle of Chinese sorghum liquor and like knock it off while talking about art and about history and about the world. And he also had a very astute understanding of China's position in the world at the time. He felt very strongly about the imperialist power's treatment of China. He felt very strongly about how China needed to assert itself in the world. He was this short, rather slight guy with thick spectacles and he he wore a, a long scholar's robe, and he was married to a wonderful woman named Shun Xia, who was a teacher of literature and a musician. She played the Chinese flute. 
And the two of them had a very deep and powerful marriage and they really loved each other. They wrote each other poetry and they were just very sensitive, thoughtful people and very outward looking people. And I think sitting around a dinner table with them and yeah, knocking off a bottle of booze would, would, be, would have been wonderful. I, I met Zhuang Yen's son. I was able to interview him for the book. He's 87, living in Taipei and Taiwan. And he has personal memories of this whole story because he was a child at the time in the, during the war. And I was able to talk to him about his parents. And so perhaps that's why I feel particularly connected to, to that particular guy, Zhuang Yan. Yeah. Now, you're a seasoned journalist, especially talking to somebody. There, there was just a lot of trauma in here. When you talk to somebody like that, is it something that you have to be very careful? You don't want to pull something out that maybe this person has kind of repressed for years? Are you a bit nervous when you walk into those interviews? Very good question. I was very careful about it, for sure. In fact, Zhuang Ling, the elderly gentleman in Taipei who I interviewed, who was a child throughout this whole experience, in fact, he's a very resilient man and himself a, an artist and photographer and very thoughtful. And a wonderful sense of humor and and uh, very articulate. And I didn't get the sense that this was a guy where there was a lot of kind of unprocessed grief or trauma. But you do put your finger on something there because I feel quite strongly that when I have talked to many other people in China, in Taiwan, and here in the United States too, people of Chinese descent, about wartime experience and about the, the, the experiences of their parents and grandparents, I do feel quite strongly that there's a lot of unprocessed memory there. And I've had this experience a number of times where people start telling me about their parents' experiences and just burst into tears or become very teary. And I feel that there's a lot of unreconciled memory about World War II and China. Many young Chinese people, I get the sense, really want to know much more about what happened to their parents and grandparents in World War II, but they haven't really got anywhere to turn to learn about it. So much of the history was dealt with very ideologically in China under communism. So much of the Japanese history is, is you know, very contested. And here in the United States, nobody talks about it. Many young Chinese people have family stories of enormous trauma, but they don't have any firm reference points for how to talk about it or understand it. I've come away with that feeling very strongly that there is a lot of, yeah, unreconciled, unsettled, unprocessed memory out that Chinese people feel. Yeah. And they have told me that. Yeah. And maybe this is an ignorant American question. Is there also kind of concern that, especially if you're talking to somebody in China, that they may hold back because there are instances where, as you talked about, things are contested. People may not want to say things on the record that can come back to them because somebody might come and talk to them about it. As you're going through this, did you run into anything like that where perhaps you weren't going to get the information you wanted because people didn't want you to have it? Or do you think you were able to kind of get to everything that you needed to? I did uh, most of my research for this from source texts, from primary source materials, and in Taiwan. It's very difficult to conduct research in China at the best of times. Conducting research in China at the moment uh, for someone like me, an ex-journalist, is next to impossible. World War II history in China, in the People's Republic of China today, is being treated in very, very particular ways. The Communist Party has laid down very particular historical narratives that you may not deviate from. There has been a campaign in the People's Republic of China run by the Communist Party called the Campaign Against Historical Nihilism. This has been going for a while. And if you deviate from historical narratives approved by the Chinese Communist Party, you can be accused of historical nihilism and the party will ruin you. Historians who have been accused of historical nihilism have lost their jobs. They've lost the ability to publish They've been shunned. They've been kicked out of professional associations. They have been ruined. And this is really no joke. One set of historians that this happened to were examining particular episodes in World War II history and particular episodes in the way that the Communist Party has narrated World War II history against the Japanese, the fight against the Japanese. And the party took against them. They decided they didn't like the way they, these historians were doing it. Between 2013 and 2015, these guys all were ruined. 
So yes, people are very, very careful these days about the way that you discuss Chinese history. Xi Jinping, the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, has made a number of speeches laying out the role of historians and archaeologists on the way history is to be treated. And we have really reverted back to tight party control on historical narratives. And it's quite frightening, and it's very difficult for historians to function in China now. So someone like me was never going to be able to go and conduct open research on on World War II in China. Well, I'm not going to ask any more questions along this line because uh, I don't want to be on a list. Although I'm probably already on a list. I don't want to be on any more lists. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of very brave people doing real history in China. Uh, Ian Johnson has just written a wonderful book about this called Sparks, dealing specifically with how journalists and historians in China are trying to preserve independent narrative history. Very important book. If you're interested in this stuff, you know, go buy it. Uh, It's great. There are a lot of people from the PRC who have moved abroad and are trying to do good history in the United States, in Europe, in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Australia, you know, you name it. A lot of great history being done. And I'm sure that in the future, you know, we will come back to a time in the PRC where things get easier again, but we don't know when that will be. Well, listen, this has been fantastic. I love this book, but there are people out there, horribly misguided people who think history is boring and reading a history book is a terrible, terrible idea. If I sat one of those people in front of you, and they said, why should I read Fragile Cargo? What would you say? I would say that I really understand that reading history, reading the history of China, particularly this far off country with a very alien and and, and sort of difficult history, uh, it's a big ask, you know, it's a big ask. People are tired, they're busy, they come home from work, they put the kids to bed, you know, they're exhausted at the end of the day, they've got an hour between finishing up in the day and going to bed. I am asking you as a reader, please don't sit down and watch Netflix, you know, please don't play a video game. No, no, spend 30 bucks and read about the intellectual history of China in the 20th century. You know, it is a big ask, I know that. So, as a writer of narrative nonfiction, I have tried to write in such a way that the reader will be engaged. I will try and give you story and people and excitement. And I hope that you will kind of absorb by osmosis without really realizing it, without really being told to eat your vegetables. You'll absorb some 20th century Chinese history, and you might even learn a little bit about Chinese art. And you might learn a little bit about some really extraordinary, very likable people who went through this extraordinary wartime experience. And you might even learn a little bit about where contemporary China comes from and where the Chinese Communist Party comes from. But I hope it won't feel like you're eating your spinach. Well, Adam, I think you nailed it. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. This has been great. And that's it for this episode. Adam, thank you so much for coming on Fragile Cargo. I'm telling you, people, you're going to love it. It's shocking, but you're going to love it. Trust me on this one. Hit us up Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You know the deal. YouTube, check us out. Send us emails. Let us know how we're doing. Until next time, nerds, stay cool. History Nerds United.